Hello everybody, this is Wei Ting here. I'm just taking some time to record a little preface before this week's Rewind a Raw, which John and I recorded about an hour and a half ago. You know, what I wanted to take the time to draw attention to was the controversy surrounding Michael Cole's voice being heard through Drew McIntyre's entrance on this Raw, which was uh, the source of much discussion coming out of the show because the thought assumed by many, including us, was that it was WWE piping in audio and perhaps the case of, you know, some bad editing where Michael Cole's call was left in. It was mysterious, but nonetheless, John and I did the rest of the show assuming that this was the case, a case of WWE piping in audio. It has come to my realization after John and I finished recording, before I, I uploaded the show, that this was in all likelihood just the source of a technical error of somebody hitting play on a SmackDown promo featuring John Cena and Michael Cole's voice at some point during Drew's entrance and not necessarily any form of nefarious piping in a fake audio, which does not perhaps discount that from happening throughout the rest of the show and other parts. Nonetheless, in this particular instance, I believe we were incorrect. So for that, I apologize and uh, hope you can enjoy the show otherwise. When Ryan when it's time to begin, it's on the rewind around with John Pollock and waiting the A team that makes sense of these things we see in the ring every week on TV. It's Rewind Around for Monday night, download a Tuesday morning from the post wrestling site. It's Rewind Around for Monday night on USA now on the John and Way take the mic. Hello, welcome to Rewind A Raw. It is John Pollock. And I'm joined by Wei Ting. Yes, I'm here. That is me. I'm not used to introducing myself, but all right. Just making sure. Just making sure we uh, get an update from the man himself. I am here. Yeah. Yeah. It is me. My computer is back in one piece. I am oh, 100%. Wonderful. I'm 110%. 110%. Well, that's yeah. that's great. Did that mean that did they over deliver on their repairs? You have a better machine than before. Okay. It's above the baseline. Well, I guess uh, after you've been without, you know, anything getting getting fully back, whatever what you had, what you once lost, you feel extra grateful for it. So maybe that's the one hundred and ten. That's the extra ten percent. My my gratitude. So your team Apple, you were kind of. Um, you were flirting with jumping over to the dark side, but I guess you have you have re- renewed with the fruit. Suppose for now, yeah, sure. You know, until they screw me again. But uh, no, I'm good. That'll happen. I'm good for now. It's it's a lot of work to try to change ecosystems. You know, I'm really fully invested in this whole thing by now. I have like files that are only Mac only. You know, I I know like Mac shortcuts, so it takes some time. I think it's like changing a, t- countries. You know, learning a different yeah. language. I'm not relearning at this stage of the game. I put too much into this one side. It'd be like admitting defeat for all these years. I'm not, I, I don't have the patience for that. I think it'd be a minimum three month adjustment. I don't, I don't have that patience. I don't, I don't have that patience in the slightest. There are people that, you know, can freely transfer between both. You know, some, some people are like Mac or I, iOS people and Android people. They just switch like depending on, I don't know, the year. They're like kind of the multilingual, you know, world travelers. I really admire people like that. Yeah, I had someone once explain to me because I had a BlackBerry back in the day and wanted to get an iPhone that, well, you use a PC, you're not going to be able to adjust to an iPhone. I was like, I, I don't think the shift to an iPhone is all, all that drastic, a, a switch. No, I think there are plenty of people in your situation. I would imagine the majority of iPhone users are probably also PC users. Blackberry, when, when you look back at it, like the, the Blackberry, like it had its... Uh, I love my Blackberry, actually. I miss I like. My I, I did too. I did too. But iPhone was greatly superior. And I could not imagine if it was the other way around, going from one to the other. Like the Blackberry, as I just remember it, like it just had... God, it was so wide and all these buttons attached to it. It's just the iPhone was just aesthetically more pleasing, not to, not to mention way more functional. Well, no doubt, yeah. Like when I didn't have my computer for like the weekend, I I I, pre- I could do most of my work like on this thing, which is incredible. I mean, it wouldn't yeah. be nearly as efficient, but I could if I wanted to. Um, whereas you know, like that was the BlackBerry was from a prior generation. I will say though, if I was forced to go back to the BlackBerry, I think there are definitely some benefits to like having a dumber 
phone. And especially for note taking, like it, it'd probably be way easier. Might be, might be. I mean, that's kind of, that was a, a primary function for those Blackberries, but nonetheless, we've given our lives over to Apple and God knows how much information that we are, or are not aware is all being stored better than, than some other companies. Yeah. Do you, do you have those moments where you're in the midst of like dealing with something and then all of a sudden you're getting like these pop-up ads that are like directly attributed to this and this isn't even like typing. It's like I, I was on, I was talking about this and oh, now no I'm getting these, I, I'm fully aware I'm under surveillance. Yeah. Like it's weird. I, I'll just mention like lawnmowers, 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 lawnmowers. I guarantee you like in the next day I'm going to get an ad for like, you know, like a real B something. Well, that's the world of algorithms, way. That's that's what we're we're stuck in. We've given up all privacy. I think everybody Once. will now. And if you're listening to this, I've just given targeted ads to all of you. At least we advertise the fact that people are listening to our conversation as we speak. Sure, it's prepared yeah. us for the mm-hmm. unknown. Well, on that note, it's a new month, way. Happy August. Are you aware it was a holiday today? It just crept up on me. I really had no idea. This is the holiday in Canada. I, I don't even know which provinces all uh, acknowledge it. And that is not an invite for anybody to message me, to alert me. I don't care. But it was a holiday today in Ontario. And it is the holiday that you would be most likely to go the whole day through not realizing there's a holiday. Unless you had a place to be that told you you do not have to be here today. Uh, yeah, it is uh, in or Ontario, at least. It's called the Civic Holiday. And uh, I don't know exactly. A lot, what a lot went into the naming of this holiday, folks. The the <laughs> mines and the dollars. It's to celebrate the most popular uh, import car, you know, from uh, from Japan. You know, everybody who drives a Honda Civic, I think, uh, gets the day off. We celebrate the uh, fuel efficiency of uh, our wonderful Civics. Um, and <laughs> I don't know. It, this it, is we, this is British Columbia Day in British Columbia. It is Heritage Day in Alberta. Natal Day in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick Day, Saskatchewan Day. It's like these okay. provinces just said we could name this a lot better than Civic Holiday. It's See, hold on New Brunswick are, Day. Are there not a million other things we could actually use the day to celebrate? Like rather than just naming some sort of bullshit thing after like Family Day is another bullshit thing. We just wanted an extra vacation day, everybody. And so uh family? Yeah, who can disagree with that? There are plenty of other reasons, especially now in Canada, for us to draw attention to on a, on this particular day than civics or British Columbia. I'm sorry, BC. Could have been um, – what What could we have celebrated? Um, Canadian Tire Day. Canadian Tire Day? Really? You get a discount. Yeah, like you get like 10 cents from what the, would you those, What would you oh, honor on this day? Well, okay, I know, I know we're, we're kind of just bantering and joking around here, but I mean, like, something to celebrate our First Nations Aboriginals people, I think that's absolutely important at this moment, you know? Like, I, I, I imagine there might actually be some, some day that, that does celebrate, but I don't think so. It's certainly not a national day off type of thing. No, we could absolutely, uh, this year of all years, use yeah. one day of, uh, at, at minimum, uh, reflective mm-hmm. point here in uh, Canada. Certainly, yeah. I can think of a million other things. Maybe better than just, you know, naming some sort of default civic holiday. Civic holiday. It's like that is, you know, you don't select from the drop down menu, so it auto generates the name of the holiday for you. Sure, yeah. But, you know, here we are, like, only we can complain about a holiday, right? I mean, it wasn't a, was it a holiday for you? I, I, no. I worked from the moment I got up, and it's now 11.30 at night, so this this was not a holiday for me today, so I can complain all I want. Our only holidays are, like, when there's no pay-per-view, I suppose. Or, like, when, when, when uh, wrestling gets preempted. Those are our holidays. When does wrestling get preempted, though? It's just... It's always there. It's always there. They don't skip a week. They just, like, push it to another day. Yeah, it's just... It, we'll make up for it. Yeah. Imagine they just announced, hey, next Monday, folks, go out with your families. We're... T- we're off. We'll be back mm. in two. Uh, let's chat a little bit about what is coming up this week. We have uh, a bunch of shows up from the weekend. We've got our Bellator post show that a lot of people seem to uh, enjoy our coverage of. We've got a new long and winding Royal Road with 
W.H. Park and J.P. Houlihan from the Grapple Spotlight Podcast. And coming up on Tuesday, it is the the much in demand return of the Ask Away Mailbag Show that I've been monitoring. We have a lot of questions this month to get through. I love Ask Away. I love this show. I, I've, you I've, love I've, it I've, because you don't have a four-hour pay-per-view to watch tomorrow morning. That is especially why I love it. But I also really like the conversation that typically come, comes out of these shows. It's pretty much open topics, and whatever you guys want to ask, we try to do our best to answer. And uh, so, you know, I don't even know what some of the topics will be. So I'm looking forward to it. And beyond that, John, the British Question, wrestling experience. Questions better be good. Yeah. Questions better be good. I also want to draw attention to our friends at the British Wrestling Experience, who uh, many of you will remember, did a 12-hour crazy stream for the Children's Heart Surgery Fund. with Mar- uh, Martin Benno did that a few weeks ago. And over the course of the next 10 days, they will be re- releasing portions from this 12-hour stream on their feed. So subscribe to British Wrestling Experience, and you'll get to hear right now an interview with Benno talking about his past as a professional wrestler, it's actually really interesting. I thought you were um, just going to leave it at that. Benno talking about his past. Well, I mean, that too. That's a hook. That, that as well. Benno talking about everything. The legend of the tracksuit. The Benno story. The legend of the tracksuit, yes. As well as wrestling historian and journalist John Lister is on this uh, first edition that's out. By the time most of you will be listening to this right now, actually, Will Cooling's episode will be on. So subscribe to British Wrestling Experience and throughout every single day, you'll have great interview to listen to and you who knows maybe you'll get to follow the descent into madness of martin bushby and benno as they go through this 12-hour stream yeah you can you can compare day by day and see when is the delirium setting in for them because you were on relatively early with your brother Mm -hmm. let's not bury the lead here james ting making his podcast debut with brother way so if you've ever been curious about the the mysterious james ting uh, this was a, a rare opportunity to hear both of them together. And uh, myself, I was on several hours later. So I, I'm a few days away, at least. And I was on for the hour with the two of them chatting about uh, a lot of different subjects. I really enjoyed that chat. I didn't know it was going to be coming out after. And I still gave my my A-plus material. So I'm glad that the it will make the, uh, the podcast uh, re-listen phase. Oh, okay. You didn't say anything that you regret? I hope. Um, I mean, other than those final 10 minutes where I gave everybody the the future news that is going to come as a complete shock to everybody. For some reason, you just started giving out your social insurance number. I don't understand. That was yeah, weird. It all ended with my big retirement at the end. But hey, you can hear the whole preamble uh, of how I got there. So there you go. Check that out. Uh, daily drops on the free British Wrestling Experience feed. But Tuesday way, I mean... Man, if you thought it was knocking at the door of this week's schedule, dude, we'd be out for two years, no doubt, because we would be testing positive instantly. We've got Up Next coming your way live on twitch.tv slash Up Next with Davey and Braden chatting about NXT and this hot main event that they have headlining TakeOver in a few weeks. And on Tuesday, Andrew Thompson interviews Chris Hero. Speaking of NXT... Um, yes, uh, twice over former yeah. member of the NXT roster. So, um, you know, Chris Hero had been, has been doing his, his podcast, but, uh, this is, I won't say his first interview since leaving WWE, but among the few, he has not been all over the place doing too many interviews. And this one was in person that Andrew did with Chris Hero. So, uh, look forward to that. I, I may have taken a peek ahead of time at some of the quotes and it's, a very intriguing interview with Chris Hero. All right. So you can listen to that or uh, watch it or read about it over. Consume it in any way you want eyes, ears, however you so desire. Every uh, orifice, every sense you can. Okay. Let's, let's dial it back a little here. Um, And then we've got, of course, all of our regular shows. We'll have a UFC 265 preview show with myself and Phil this Thursday at one Eastern at YouTube.com slash post wrestling. We're running unopposed this Thursday. So I think that the 18th of 34 number is going to be up dramatically. And uh, we're not we're not going against the big beast. That is the wellness policy. Well, you will actually be going up against it in a podcast form, but not live. So not live. We're not we're not maniacs. 
So uh, all of that to come this week. Kate from Montreal will be joining Way on Friday for Rewind to SmackDown. And it leads up to Sunday, the return, the August edition of the NWA podcast, the runaway success here at postwrestling.com. Nate Milton, Chris Ely, and Andrew Thompson coming your way this Sunday. Oh, so much great stuff here. And it's the beginning of the month. So if you so desire, uh, bonus shows every week, archives, ability to have access so subscribe much, right? now, everybody. Listen, you're going to get uh, Rewind the one Smackdown. day of the month we bother you. Rewind a Smackdown every Friday. Okay, the return of MCU later with What If starting next week. You're going to get that every single week, everybody. It's Rewind Away. It's the return of Talk later this week. It's... Uh, later this know, month, not this week. Oh, sorry, this month. Yeah, you're right. Um, I'm sure there's there probably it will be some New Japan thing. Rampage is debuting this month, everybody. That's and right. That will Rampage be... will be a cafe exclusive on Friday nights paired with SmackDown. And I'm, I have not consulted with Way. I don't think we need to rename the show and just like contort this name into something silly like ram down your throat or some stupid concoction of taking these two words and making them one. I'm just. Can we just leave it? Sure. Yeah. At least for the first. Unless, at least we have a theme. We, we have a th- we have a song to start this. I, I don't want another remix. You're right. Yeah. I don't want to bother uh, Identity Crisis again to to re- redo the song until we come up with a better name or until we hear the suggestion for a better name. It's going to be Rewind a Smackdown. It's just easier. Um, so yeah, there. Postwrestlingcafe.com is where you can go. Uh, we'll have plenty this month uh, coming at you. It's still weird to me, Way, that we are here in August, and it's, I mean, the second year in a row, but no G1. It's weird. I'm not used to this in August. I love it, because the G1 at this point would be awful. This like, would have been bad. This would have been a bad week, as it's going into the, the key final two weeks of G1 season, typically. But, I mean, this was my, from 2013 through 2019, like this was July and August was just keeping up with that tournament nonstop. Yeah, poor poor you, man. Like missing. No, out not on all poor this. me. I'm I'm fine that this summer is uh not we do not need a G one in the moment. There's so much wrestling going on to keep up with. It is crazy. Fall is kinda nice, but I also like I'm trying to think the most convenient time for a G one for me. When that would be? I feel like the winter would be a nice time. You know, like people, I'm not. The, I'm the fall is pretty good. Like se- September, October, November are not, you know, b- traditionally. I mean, you're, you're going to get outliers like 2019 when Dynamite launched and NXT was going up. But that uh, the fall is like, it, it, can, it can use a little punch. You know what I mean? So I'm fine yeah, with sure. it in the fall. All that said, the G1 will probably make its way back to the summer. And then a year from now, we will be uh, lamenting all the wrestling. But we do that anyway. So here we are. Let's go into a lot of the news because we have a bit to catch up with from over the weekend. I want to make note off the top. Um, uh, we, we do have a piece up on the site uh, covering the career of Hideki Hosaka, who died at the age of 49 after he had been battling cancer for the last two years. The cancer had spread to his lungs. He had been wrestling. He made his debut in 1991. This was just after his 20th birthday. He uh, wrestled for the uh, the wing promotion, uh, FMW through 2001, uh, was part of the Zen group with uh, Wing Kanemura and Atsushi Onida, and then later Team Zero with Onida. And then after leaving FMW in 01, he would bounce around with Big Japan and then largely settled into All Japan, wrestling there until 04, when he suffered a pretty devastating knee injury that took him out for two years and would wrestle the rest of his career as a freelancer from 2006 up until the summer of 2019. Um, I did put up a, a story, and I'll be perfectly honest. like I was not super familiar with Hideki Hosaka uh, throughout his career. He was not someone's career who I, I followed uh, very much. But I would recommend everyone to this this great obit that I read today. You can find it. It's linked in the update. If you want to go fmwwrestling.us slash Hosaka dot HTML. Uh, this is uh, Brett who runs that site, who is an expert on FMW. It's a really great obit on someone that got to know Hosaka, especially over the, the last couple of years. There's a lot of interesting details in that story. Um, that I would encourage everyone to go read. It was a pretty definitive 
rundown of his career. SmackDown on Friday night from our guest on Friday, Brandon Thurston, reporting this number. 2,043,000 with a .57 in the demo, 742,000 viewers. Uh, Brandon noting that uh, this was largely helped by the 18 to 34 number that was up 31%. So uh, down from the prior week, uh, both going against the Olympics, but this was the third consecutive week where they did top 2 million viewers. So I would say hovering at you know, a, a fine level, uh, your progno- prognostication way that a month from now, once SummerSlam is in the rearview mirror, John Cena is, you know, we know he's doing that Madison Square Garden show, and maybe we should look a few weeks after that big MSG show. Do you see SmackDown maintaining this 2 million viewership level? Like what, how much do you attribute this little jump to fans being back, John Cena being on the show? Do you think they, they can stay at this level or is there going to be a drop off? I definitely think there's going to be a drop off. Um, I think everything you are seeing right now is primarily because of those two things. But I mean, we're we're also talking about Olympics that's competing against it too. So how much is that? Is that offsetting some of these results? Um, Personally, which we'll know soon because the Olympics wrap up. This will be the last Friday that they contend with them, and we'll we'll at least get a few weeks after in August where you will have the Cena effect, but you won't have Olympic competition. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and then at that point, it's really just kind of these audiences and these crowds that are left to perhaps, you know, elevate this SmackDown number from what you would expect it to have been before. Um, I'm I'm expecting it to maybe go back down to the same range as prior. Yeah, I'm I'm watching these shows, and I really do hope like there is a there is a battle plan for the fall because you see like so much is built around SummerSlam and they are going this direction where your two major challengers are John Cena and Bill Goldberg. And beyond that MSG appearance by Cena, like we're not expecting those two to be part of any plans coming out of SummerSlam. So it's just having some pieces and ideas in place. And perhaps that is a strategy with Becky Lynch, for instance, who, you know, has not had any return yet and could be something like a post SummerSlam idea if she is ready to come back. Two, I can see, you know, otherwise you, you recently redebuted Sasha on that brand, but after the Bel Air match, I can also see them perhaps doing a swap for her and Becky. So we shall see. The first dance is sold out. The public on sale date was today and WrestleTix noting that uh, the tickets that were available were gone in about five minutes. Um, by that outlet's account, uh, over 13,600 tickets out uh, for this. There is tickets on like the, the resale um, for, for Ticketmaster that you can grab. But this, this is a sellout. And again, we talked a lot about this just from the presale uh, momentum they had on Friday, uh, a tremendous success for this United Center show. And I think this this only backs up the the amount of intrigue in a fan base that wants to be in that building for what they view as a very significant moment, that being CM Punk uh, appearing in a wrestling arena for the first time. Uh, unmasked, I guess, because we did have some of those uh, apparent uh, indie appearances where he may have been masked, but... CM Punk in the flesh at the United Center, or this crowd may riot. Yeah. <laughs> um, it would I, be, <laughs> dude, this would replace the finger poke of doom if uh, if the man did not come out. And as you pointed out, like, even Brian Danielson coming out, that crowd would amazingly leave disappointed, if, even if it was Danielson in his place. Listen, if I'm Tony Khan, I'm making sure that CM Punk is locked in his apartment from now until that day and that nothing possibly happens to this man. Okay, nothing can kind of keep him from this show. Uh, I'm not letting him out of his room until he is ready to make that short Uber tri- Uber trip from his apartment to the United Center because he needs to be at that place. Uh, and yeah, it, uh, you know, beyond that, I imagine they will do their best to put on a good show. What's really interesting is the fact that this is only an hour broadcast. So how will they flesh out the rest of the show to, you know, to, to fill this audience's time and, and possibly like, you know, the, the, the ticket that they, they purchased for? Because this has to feel like a bigger than a one hour show for sure. It, it definitely. Um, if, 
if people are kind of intrigued about sort of the structure of the show and just different uh, ratings patterns, I did have a chance over the weekend to listen to the chat that Brandon Thurston did with Chris Harrington and just going through. This wasn't so much um, like the last time that Chris Harrington joined him. They kind of went through that week's ratings and just going through all of this. And there was a lot of that, including this uh, this Apple program that I can't even describe to you what it is that Chris Harrington uses to compare all the different demographics with these charts and such. It's, it's quite the, uh, it's quite the watch and it is a video as well, but I mean, it just goes into a lot of just the, just the different things such as when they're looking at minute by minute numbers, it's not always like a clean minute is going to be part of your broadcast. And then the other minute is part of the commercial. It's like, sometimes it'll be 30 seconds is the commercial 30 seconds is when you're coming back. And do you throw that minute out? There's also a lag effect they find. And Chris noted that if a, if something is under four minutes, they kind of just disregard it. It's like that's not enough time to even really properly gauge whether it was successful or not. And mm-hmm. and they can find established patterns. Like he isolated the Britt Baker, Nilo Rose promos in the lead up to that match did very well, as did the match. And just c- comparing different things impact such as NBA competition had that has informed them a bit of what to expect for Rampage. But at the same time, it's not going to be going against NBA competition. And what they found with those Friday night uh, dynamites that aired over the month because of the NBA was that when you break things down to live viewership, same day, which is you know, several hours after the live broadcast, that's a second category, and then delayed viewing, which is several days after the fact, they found that their live viewing went down, but the delayed viewing went up as well. So while the numbers were down, they were not as dramatic a drop as they look if you're just looking at live and same day. So if you're into a lot of that data stuff, Chris explains it very well. Um, and it's an interesting discussion on the uh, WrestleNomics uh, YouTube channel that they have up there. Okay, let's get into some of these releases because this was, I guess, the big news over the weekend. And we'll just go uh, starting with Bray Wyatt. This announcement was made on Saturday by WWE. And I would say, Wade, there was certainly a time when a release of that magnitude, I think, would just be stunning to people. I don't know if that's the case anymore. I think after somebody like a Braun Strowman is released, I don't know save for, you know, your ultra top end guys that I don't think are going to be in that category. Uh, Bray Wyatt would still be in, to me, that Braun Strowman level that it's a surprise, but it is also one that I I don't think is as shocking after what we have seen this year, where uh, cuts have been ex- extreme as compared to years past, where they had really dialed back on the annual releases that have not been happening. I would agree with that. Um, but to me, what what did make this one surprising more so than Braun Strowman is the fact that from what we hear, Bray Wyatt is a tremendous merchandise seller. Certainly. And that alone tells you that he provides incredible value to this company that you would assume would be somewhat untouchable. But, you know, this the reason that we are hearing, of course, is budget cuts. Right. But um, do you think that's the whole story? I think I think when people hear budget cuts, the the automatic assumption is to just laugh it off. And of course, if you're looking at it from the perspective of profit versus loss, of course, it's laughable for this company that is going to make record profits this year and has, you know, revenues that they you would be just in awe of a decade ago. However, it is also, you know, markers and projections that analysts expect them to make and i put that under the category of budget cuts like it is not about just being in the in the black or red during the year it is we have to be at this level and meet this guidance and that is probably you know talent budget is probably one where this is somewhere where we can become leaner in when you have a giant number attached to you there is a target that when we have to make these cuts, it is easier to make a cut at someone who is making this much than cutting four people, for instance, that might equal that one person's salary or come close to it. Uh, the, the merchandise, that's a huge component to the Bray Wyatt character that he he was a big merchandise mover. That was a huge uh, point in his favor and this characters, which was one that I would say 
polarizing at best was this character. And I'm kind of of two minds. I, I always, I think, have an appreciation for those talents that you can see are ones that are not just, I'm going to show up and do what is told of me and I'm paid to go out and do as I'm told. The ones that really take a grasp on their careers and have a lot of that input and have that care, I always tend to bet on those people that they're going to be successful in different places. I have no doubt that Bray Wyatt was a very, and is, a very creative individual, and he was kind of touted as like this this success story. Someone that had, you know, as Husky Harris was a failed character that reinvented himself in that NXT system and was a spotlight on NXT of look at this act that we have cultivated in the Wyatt family. And then he did it again with this fiend character that I think had um, much more pushback towards it. And until he speaks openly about it, I don't think we're going to know about the creative push and pull that he had versus it's not like this guy was given free reign that here's your fiend character. You tell us what you're doing. This is always going to be a compromise at the very least of uh, that you're working in concert with with creative and ultimately Vince McMahon. Was this the vision that Bray Wyatt had with this fiend that we saw and kind of a lot of the elements of the character that lost a lot of people, hurt a lot of baby faces. And it was, you know, it was a character to me that I, I could appreciate people that got into it. But to me, it was a, a character that would did more damage on the program than, than positive. Hmm. Well, I'm personally really interested to see what he does outside of the system. Cause I am of the belief that he is a brilliant mind in professional wrestling and somebody who, you know, is able to usher in completely different foreign ideas that, yeah, perhaps we should be honest and say don't always work. But I also feel like outside of the system is where he will be able to find a, 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 a solution to perhaps, you know, making some of these other, these things fit better into a wrestling context, maybe working with other creatives. It might be a way for him to perhaps tailor some of these wild ideas into something that's a lot more palatable for a wrestling audience. We don't know whose idea it was to put a red light on throughout the entire thing. We don't know whose idea it was to, I don't know, get set, lit on fire, set him on fire or to have Alexa dr uh, dr drip goo down her face as the end of a match. There are a million terrible things that have happened as a part of the Firefly or sorry, the, the fiend characters run. But, you know, we don't exactly know what is going to be attributed to this man himself. I'm of the belief that a lot of the brilliance comes from him. I would like to believe that maybe some of the stuff that does not, that was not all that great um, came from somewhere else. And you know what? This will be a true test. What's unfortunate is that we will no longer be able to see this Fiend character. It is, from what we would assume, the IP of the WWE's. At the same time, when you're talking about somebody this creative, um, I don't think they, they'll they have any shortage of, you know, being able to create something brand new and maybe much more exciting um, wherever the, this person works later on. Uh, I'm personally really interested to see the type of thought and the type of, like, care put into a story or a segment or a vignette that we saw from this guy in the Firefly Funhouse at WrestleMania against John Cena, which to this day is one of my favorite things I've seen in professional wrestling. Um, didn't always hit that. And even that segment did not hit for many, many people. But for me, it hit really hard. I, I want to see him reach that level of magic again. You know, it just depends which company he could work with right now. Because AEW is certainly bloated, uh, you, you could say. They have people coming in that, you know, deserve a whole lot of airtime. They have people on the roster that aren't getting enough airtime. Can they use a Bray Wyatt? And, and, and that's not, one way where... The second they announce uh, Bray Wyatt, um, there's going to be a lot of resistance to that announcement because the automatic assumption will be taking a lot of the fantastical elements that I think turned a lot of people off in WWE, and that's what this character represents. So it, it's going to be – it's very tough because in many ways that character was perfect for WWE, and it's a much tougher fit in other places. So I think it's going to be forced to – go through adaption and, and we're going to see, like, I, 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 I certainly look at this guy as someone that is, I, I think he can provide a lot of interesting developments and he's going to get that opportunity, uh, should he pursue it. And it's just a question of where and, and what is the appetite going to be?
because AEW is going to be the first one everyone is going to assume, whether they uh, want to go in that direction or not. They have a lot of different – they have a lot going on. So I don't know where a Bray Wyatt would necessarily fit on their priorities. They have a lot going on, and I think there's something to – you know the the argument that they have they are taking too many of WWE's you know releases, um, and do they want that? Do they want that reputation? I personally feel like everybody who goes through those doors will probably reinvent themselves in some way that we won't really think about that. But if not AEW, where else could you see Bray Wyatt ending up? And let's be honest, who can afford him right now? If if it is like a high salary that perhaps is the reason for this budgetary cut, could you just imagine? Brian Danielson on this on this whirlwind tour in AEW, and then all of a sudden, the fiend pops up from behind him, and he sees him. Oh shit! Who? Who? Brian Danielson. Oh, Brian seeing, Danielson. Seeing yeah. the fiend, he grows his hair out this whole time, and then like yeah, the fiend comes out, takes his hair off. Can you imagine the fiend in the G one? Um, There's your new KOPW champion, the fiend. Uh. No, nothing, nothing surprises me in wrestling. Very little surprises me, um, including Ric Flair. Uh, this is the next one. Uh, wrestling Inc. was the first to report this, that uh, Ric Flair had apparently requested and was granted his release. Uh, Fightful adding that uh, Flair, you know, flat out, like, called up Vince McMahon. He was, you know, unhappy with, with certain aspects, wanted his release. He got his release. The company has not... Uh, put out any statement about Ric Flair, but I think that's that's a really interesting one of Ric Flair, seventy two years old. That figured, you know what? I I'll be happy elsewhere. You hear that type of talk from pr- perhaps people, you know, like in their thirties, perhaps you know, people maybe even a little bit older than that who feel like they have a lot more to give to this to this industry. You wouldn't expect that from a seventy year old man who you know has, <laughs> um. Definitely wrestled his last match, but clearly Ric Flair is a different person, and uh, he perhaps can command a lot more storyline attention, maybe even, you know, at this point, is money that important to him? I know the man no, has I, I, many I, divorces. I, I, I should never say with Ric Flair, money is not important. That's always, uh, I think, going to be um, considered for sure. But I think also, like, this is more so, I think this guy wants to have fun in his career. And believe mm. me, had this happened at a different time point and maybe they could still do it dude andrade's new front man mm-hmm. <laughs> rick flair they could still do it of course they, they can. could still do it the thing that i think really just underscores this this whole current is that when this news came out today there were all of these ideas it's like my god aew and this is spearheaded by tony khan who is like this admitted super fan he could assemble the four horsemen and there's wow. nothing stopping him from doing that of just fun stuff to do. And it's all these things that you oh, could have done second. with. Who, who's the fourth? No, I'm saying like he could reunite the the original yeah. horseman saying, that well, he's I'm got. Who would you, are you saying Oli? Like, who's so I'm not, not I'm not including Oli. Oli will probably never see the uh, uh, dynamite. But I mean, you've you've got Arn, you've got Tully, JJ's been on the show. Like, you could do some really cool segment with those two and then you could weave rick flair into so many different areas i think for a whole generation they have seen rick flair handcuffed on these promos where he's barely allowed to talk and i guarantee if you let this guy go out he's still going to be better than 75 percent of the guys out there i i would say so too but maybe with a caveat like i don't know if you i still have some concern personally about like giving rick flair a live mic at, at times um i think in a controlled environment maybe you kind of let him test the waters and see how it is him on dark him on like elevation or late night dynamite whatever give him like an hour like put him on commentary i feel like he'd be ent- entertaining as hell but I'm, i feel like there's probably still a level of control but you know what you're right like if you're if you're rick flair and you live through that st- God awful Lacey Evans storyline that we all had to sit through. I mean, how could you? How could you? you know, and he was open were... about his disdain for that. I mean, I included yeah. the quotes like when he talked to Ariel Hawani. I mean, that was one where he was not. Um, and Ric Flair has not traditionally bit his tongue when it when it comes to uh, stuff like that. Like he was not happy with that. And you know, it's like you. I really believe like if you're a performer and you're seeing dynamite right now, 
it's got to get your creative juices flowing. It just seems like it's so much fun there. It's not all of these restrictions. And what do I want out of this? And I mm-hmm. think like that's a really appealing part. And I, I honestly, I could not see if Ric Flair is going to work with any company. I don't see anyone else but AEW unless there's just some ridiculous money offer that comes his way. But it just seems like a hand in a glove for Ric Flair to spend his remaining years on television on AEW. And I think Tony Khan would do cartwheels to um, make Ric Flair part of AEW. I think so, too. Um, Again, you know, we talk about how much airtime you can have. And granted, it's Ric Flair. Perhaps you make an exception for him. Like, yeah, sorry. Um luchasaurus like we can't make time for for you this week it's it's rick Rick flair Flair. with luchasaurus (laughs) that scene would be quite the thing yeah uh the possibilities i i do truly feel like yeah rick flair in that system will be a great of great service to an up-and-comer like uh an mjf rick flair segment like would be crazy you know just think about the possibilities as long as the focus is put on the new generation as long as you continue to like you know, make those guys your spotlight, your main event, and the attraction and the things that you can rely on for the years to come, not at the expense of putting a Ric Flair in a main event, for instance. Um, no one's talking that on? about that. But, like, look, though, like, let's give credit to the track record, though. And I'm not even talking about, like, the utilization of an Arn Anderson or a Tully Blanchard, but mm-hmm. what's Sting's primary focus been? It's been to make Darby the star. Christian Cage with Jungle Boy. Like, they... And I think in both those cases, the younger stars have benefited from that association where Sting does not overshadow Darby and Christian does not overshadow Jungle Boy. Um, I think that like that has, I think, always been their their usage. I mean, they're trying to a lesser degree with Matt Hardy. I don't think that one has worked as well. But that's still the thinking. I don't think they're looking at, you know, bringing in Ric Flair. I mean, it's like he would only be used, I think, for, you know, fun segments and just... There's so many ideas when you think about it, when the handcuffs are off and what fantasy ideas have existed for a Ric Flair over the last five years. There are so many, John, but at the same time, like, where do you draw the limit if you're Tony Khan? You know, like there are going to be more releases from the WWE. Do you consider everyone? Um, I'm not talking about Ric Flair being a weekly character either, but I see him being part of that bringing him in and he is associated with AEW. There's a lot of great value to a Ric Flair. I, st- I, want, I still feel I, today. Personally, I want to see Ric Flair do the tour of the entire independent scene. Not, not just the independent, but the entire world outside of, of wrestling. Every company is working with each other right now. I want to see Flair turn up in uh, Impact. I want to see him turn up in, in NWA. I want to see him turn up in uh, Game Changer. Game, game Changer. Amazing. Nick Gage, Ric Flair. Death match, amazing. Yes, I want to see him make the rounds, you know, because w- w- like on, on the indie scene is where, man, you might see some of the best flair. But anyway, we uh, it's fun, it's fun, and jump in the jump in the pool, Rick. Okay, or, or last take a, one. Take a suplex to the pool. I mean, t- we know he can take a vertical into a swimming pool. That's been established. Mm-hmm. Last one here uh, again from Wrestling Inc., who were the first to report that Adam Cole's contract with WWE actually expired last month around the Great American Bash, and he agreed to an extension through SummerSlam weekend, which has takeover on the Sunday night. And, I mean, this is going to be an incredibly interesting case of someone that has now been there for four years and has done everything there is to do in NXT. I would say that NXT does not feel like a brand that is continuing to grow if does feel like it's sort of hit a uh it has hit a ceiling Mm -hmm. in in terms of its growth and you as the viewer looking at it as not the priority it once was i don't know like if i'm adam cole there is a lot of arguments uh to leaving and that you have done are you looking at continuing your tour of duty of nxt in the same role where you'll be a top guy uh main roster has I don't know if I'm dying to do that at the moment. And it's a pretty exciting scene out outside of there. So I think you look at Adam Cole. Um, I mean, there's, yeah. I would certainly be looking AEW, at AEW. Let's where just do I say want it, John. To be going? Let's just say it, John. Every AEW single is person. the obvious one. But every single is, person we've talked about is AEW, AEW, AEW. But th- this is, is the bigger question. Wait, what is the argument to stay? No, none. I mean, okay. Isn't that a pretty damning assessment? 
Totally. Absolutely. This is the biggest company in the world. He didn't even make it to the main roster. And that's almost a positive at this point for mm-hmm. him. Completely. Yeah. I, I would say it's almost guaranteed purgatory. for If they treat Keith Lee, a guy the size and the agility of a Keith Lee, if they treat Keith Lee like that, what chance does Adam Cole have? The only chance he has if he gets gets on a... He, if he jobs for like maybe a year straight and then the fans cheer for him so much that you end up like have they end up like taking over the crowd. And now these days, who knows if that, that can even happen and somehow he gets pushed. And that's probably like a five year process and not even guaranteed. Um, but if you're Adam Cole, like you have this other this other thing in AEW right now where your girlfriend is working um, that would probably book you really well. And it exists as tremendous leverage to take you away from, you know, where, whatever contract you're, you're currently under. Because um, NXT, uh, sad to say, it doesn't feel like there, there's that much of a future for him. He has done so much already. Like, he's recycling programs right now. And, you know, that really seems to be the most logical move. But again, we talk about AEW and whether or not it's... Well, they have... Of the three names, John, who, who would you take that we just oh. discussed? I mean, Adam Cole would be your your. It, it's it's totally different comparing Adam Cole to Ric Flair and the value that they bring. I think there's great value in both. I think Bray Wyatt is more of a wild card. It could it could work. Like he could he could be totally reinvented and comes in and it's it's totally different than uh, before. But if you're looking for the sure thing of someone that would seamlessly come in, uh, the guy is 32 years old. He just turned 32. I mean, if you're Adam Cole. And even if you have aspirations of making it to the top of WWE, you leave and go for four years to AEW, dude, you're going to be 36. You can come back and you could be in WWE for years after that as a headliner. You'll be more valuable if you go to AEW and you know where you're, where you're, where you're going to stand there. It would be to his benefit versus now where it's – I think it's almost like you have painted yourself into a corner – by being in NXT for so long. When they're when they're bringing these guys up to look at dark matches and who they're bringing up, they're not bringing up Gargano. They're not bringing up O'Reilly and they're not bringing up Adam Cole. Like I don't think like he is the guy that jumps out at them because he's been under their nose for 4 years. He hasn't gotten great overnight. He's been close to the level he was on day 1 and that was 2017. Yeah, I mean, a big part of this, and maybe the timing is really just terrible for them, but, you know, if his contract had run out while NXT was, like, while they were doing that Survivor Series, while they were making the big push for NXT to grow beyond what NXT was into perhaps a bona fide third brand up to the level of a Raw and SmackDown, I feel like you'd have a very different opinion. But you're talking about an NXT right now that is pretty much like, you know, being relegated to back to complete developmental in the WWE system. And that's probably not a great place for a guy who's already hit a ceiling in that promotion to be. So, you know, he also loves working with Taker or sorry, Triple H and, and Sean, though. I mean, I imagine, you know, that 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 would sort of be a, a, a personal decision that would probably be kind of difficult for him. And I'm sure Sean and Hunter are, are doing everything they can to try to promise him the world. But ultimately... You know, they can only do so much. Uh, Final things here. Uh, New Japan has announced their uh, shows from August 7th through 17th uh, for the Summer Struggle Tour. Um, There's uh, the biggest of those shows is August 10th with a never six man title match. But I guess the most notable thing way is of those cards over that 10 day stretch. Kota Bushi is not listed for any of those shows. So at least through August 17th, not listed. So, I mean, that's I mean. That's, it's that's got to say something about how he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's concerning. You know, we, um, we, we thought this would just be a really small thing and him missing weeks and weeks of action now for, it, it tells me that this. keeping it till the day before of whether his status would be, what his status would be for the Tokyo dome is like, there must've been almost no shot that he could do the Tokyo dome. And they were just hoping upon hope that he'd be ready. Perhaps, man. You know, and again, it's like these are kind of dark times for New Japan. Um, like Kota Ibushi's health aside, that to me is like number one priority, making sure that he's, that he's okay. But, you know, as far as these cards, it's like nothing's really inspiring. Here we are talking about like, you know, AEW and possibly the the entire system. Everybody we got in the Dick rest Togo of the and Ghetto in the Super Junior Tag League. Did you glaze over that? I was aware, yeah. Well, uh, 
yeah, the point stands, unfortunately. So nothing all that inspiring about some of these New Japan shows, but um, I'm sure the wrestling will be pretty good. And the last thing is that PWG made their return on Sunday night, and some of the big surprise. This was uh, all of it was unannounced. It was their Mystery Vortex show. Uh, so some of the people that did show up, they had Evil Uno against Orange Cassidy. I heard that Jonathan Gresham and Lee Moriarty was uh, tremendous. As was the opener with Tony Deppen and Jake Cartwheel, who's been working GCW shows. It sounds like it was a big performance for for Jake Cartwheel. It seemed like that match got over very strong. Uh, but the big match was. Uh, Bandito retaining the PWG title over Black Taurus, and then afterward, uh, Super Dragon making his surprise appearance, attacking Bandito, and then it was Brody King and Malachi Black appearing uh, for what sounded like just a massive uh, reaction, and it ended with uh, Malachi Black and Brody King agreeing to team up at the next PWG show on September 26th. Sounds so awesome. Like, just everybody from every promotion working together on these little islands and, you know, every character staying true to who they are. And it's just, uh, I think it's just the way wrestling should be. It's great. Yeah. The the only uh, complaint I heard from someone who was at the show was just that, um, you know, with the combination of it being the mystery show and uh, Dave Meltzer had noted that someone from AEW would be showing up. It's like the expectations just... When you set that, especially for this audience, I mean, it's like the, it's their first show back. It's like, God, are they, who is going to show up that you're just, your mind is racing at all these different possibilities. But it sounded like it was a, a very enjoyable show. I would say Malachi Black, like, lives up to those expectations, don't you? Yeah, it was, it was cool. And he was in the character, too. Like, he was there as Malachi Black, not, uh, you know, Tommy Ann Tommy Sans makeup. All right, we have gone super long here with news, so let's get into Raw from the Allstate Arena. Uh, sorry, do, do you hear Michael Cole in your ear? Is it bleeding Six, through? 16 time, what? 16 time. So I think this, this theory was introduced by Kate, and you've yes. kind of been much, you've been really keeping an I've ear been to skeptical. this. I've been skeptical. You've been very skeptical, and I, like, I don't have the best ear for this. It's, but... <laughs> What my argument was is like we need some evidence uh, to support this. <laughs> Tonight we got our evidence, dude, because Drew McIntyre is coming out, and all of a sudden you hear Michael Cole's audio bleeding through. Um, so I oh. mean, live show or not, like they had no reservations, and maybe for this show they were more than ready uh, because we got multiple uh, CM Punk chants, although none I would say sustained to the point that it was. Um, well, but how noticeable. Could how, how could we tell, John? Because I mean, who who's to say they didn't silence them with can noise the moment they started to peer out? Well, I regardless, don't, I, don't I mean, does that matter then? Like, if they could control it, um, that was less of a black eye. Like, maybe they were more prevalent, but you know, they broke out several times. Whatever. Like, who cares at this point? It's like the guy. We know the guy's coming. It's like. They will stop eventually. You know, it's it, he's coming back, everybody. Like, there's no reason to chant him. But this is Chicago, so... Uh, it, it was they, also, they like... Prevalent. Th- like, bad stuff happening when they came out. Like, it was... God, mm-hmm. that terrible Ms. TV segment. I mean, they... So it's not like they were just... They were just Ooh, chanting but, it at, like, times when it really didn't fit. It was, like, it was their dissatisfaction. Who are the crowd going to chant for now, now that Punk's coming back? Like, what what are they going to replace that chant with? Jack Briscoe? He never Jack came back. Jack Briscoe. Jack Briscoe. What? Jack Briscoe can't come back. So that's that would be that's that's a return that will not happen. Um Yeah, uh but that particular clip for those of you who haven't seen it was Drew McIntyre walking up for his entrance and it was just like some weird background audio of Cole talking about him being a sixteen time like so what? That was a clip reserved for somebody else? I mean for a Cena? That'd be a Cena clip, right? Yeah. I'd, you know, maybe some excuse will come out somewhere, but like, uh, the wrong tape was played in the background. This was not what it was. Like, it's terrible for, I think I would say that maybe the online reputation of Drew McIntyre, who all I always felt definitely like didn't gain many fans, I would assume, from his history teacher moniker, but I feel like has been kind of resuscitated, resuscitating his character in recent weeks. Um, the knowledge that they would have to go to those links to like add voice to, to his entrance i'm i'm a little bit surprised by that and you know what like we're doing this show right afterwards maybe there is a logical explanation behind it all 
that is not what we think but um it's it's a bad look well bobby lashley an mvp started the program where uh, Corey graves called bobby lashley the most dominant champion in recent history a rare instance of them tempering the superlatives attached to not the most de- dominant champion in history let's be realistic here recent history recent history well what There's would no you bruno say? yeah <laughs> yeah mvp immediately encouraged a goldberg chant and he said goldberg is a gladiator but lashley is not a gladiator way lashley is a kaiju kaiju yeah you fan of, you're a fan of the kaijus Yes, and he teed up the the big battle at SummerSlam. He said MVP wants to prevent a tragedy, and Goldberg can either be remembered as a champion or a casualty. And at this point, I wrote, the Goldberg chant started to pick up. I don't know what to believe anymore, Way. My job's impossible, honestly. Like, we cannot gauge... There there were definitely points, like, you could see, like, at different points where there, there was different chants, and you could see the audience, like, getting into stuff. Yeah, I do not think this was a case of like a dead crowd and them just uh, putting stuff over with. But I, I think you kind of opened the door that fans are going to be skeptical, skeptical at times of uh, manipulation. And that's it's not it's, this did not start in the Thunderdome era. I mean, this has been something mm-hmm. WWE has used in its history, especially with these Goldberg chants you know, at the start of his entrance. I mean, I, I, I feel like even prior to the Thunderdome era, they were already kind of being manipulated and yeah, on various other shows. But now especially, it's um, it's weird. It's really weird. So Goldberg comes out. He says that they can smell fear and he tells Lashley, you either crap your pants or you're scared out of your pants. It's like, that's a, that's a <laughs> interesting multiple choice. You either crap your pants or you're scared out of your pants. What would you rather, Way? Would you rather? <laughs> I don't want to know. It's a fucking weird line to say, period, in the middle of trash talk, okay? And as you're about to fight an opponent. Can you imagine this at a UFC press conference, John? Like somebody saying this line? I, I actually can for some that really try and do not land it <laughs> so well. Like I could totally imagine Colby Covington saying this line verbatim. There seemed to be a point where Goldberg just like paced down the ring and back. Like this was, this was like scripted Goldberg that I think yeah. is, uh, you know, we've heard Goldberg do great promos in that Brock promo uh, program, and he was you mm-hmm. could tell like this was a guy that was largely just left to as little as possible. You are Bill Goldberg, and you mm-hmm. know how to be Bill Goldberg. So instead, here he it- had to talk for several minutes. This felt like somebody else's interpretation of what Goldberg should say. And thus weird as hell lines like you're going to either crap your pants or jump out of your pants. Like, who the fuck says this? Okay, as as silly as that was, the worst line was scripting Bill Goldberg to call it out and say, it doesn't matter if I'm 35 or 105. He said 35, 45, and 105. And what is his real age? Bill, he's what, 52 is the guess. He's closer to 55 than he is 45, okay? He's 54, 54. Oh, he's 55, basically. It did not say 55. He skipped over that. He went right from 45 to 105. I just don't know why you're you're calling out the age. Like, why why even bring that out? Um, Yeah, it's not. Did MVP call out his age? Did MVP call him old? No, this was Goldberg just outlining his age. So he says that he lives by the spear, you'll die by the spear, you're next. And then he exited, fist bumped his son in the front row and just left him there. And then Lashley got into young Gage's face. Everyone remembers Gage Goldberg. And MVP tells Gage that Lashley will end your father's career. So Goldberg comes back, spears MVP, which got a big pop. And then Gage left with Goldberg. So what I realized is that the dream match down the road, folks. Gage, Hook. And Dominic, three-way. Are you kidding Dominic me? could get in there, too. I, Gage I only say this 90% joking. I'll say this. I leave 10% that this would not absolutely stun me. That <laughs> Oh, yeah. Lashley versus Gage at some point will occur. <laughs> I could Dude, totally like, 
Did you look at this kid? Okay, the man had a glow up. Okay, he's not the chubby kid we saw five years ago. The man. Oh yeah, he's like, like, he's like playing he's like, a man like high school football and stuff. These. Oh you know, yeah, little kid is in shape. Training he's... with his dad. It's like you know, he has grown up significantly from 2017, where he was just taking his shirt off in the ring. Yeah, now he'll probably take the shirt off and be like, "Yeah, just, uh, you know, trolls, internet trolls have at it." So I. I mean, look look at how he, he's starting right now. I'm sure, like, his dad would love to see Sun fall in his footsteps. So that was our segment, and later Lashley accepted the match for SummerSlam. Yeah. Are you excited? Um, This, this wasn't the segment that I would say it needed to be. Pretty typical, like, Goldberg build, right? Like, by the numbers, Goldberg build. Come out with a big entrance, like, stare down, have, you know... Say you're next. That's kind of it. So, I mean, at the end of it, it is a high-profile match at SummerSlam, presumably a big win for Bobby Lashley coming out of it. Um, that's what you get from a Goldberg appearance. Drew McIntyre is hanging out with Sarah Schreiber with his sword. And it's... We never did an interview here. We just went to Veer and Shanky in the ring with Jinder Mahal. And Drew comes out... And they explain his sword is now named Angela after his late mother. And this is where we got the uh, the audio glitch. And the match begins. There were some CM Punk chants during this. And then Drew hit Veer with a belly to belly. And then he did a kip up. And he almost went to do the suck it to Shanky. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what was up with tonight. But we got two instances of this on the show. Do you know what the other was? Uh, no. What was the other one? In the main event on the floor, Charlotte just looks at someone in the crowd and goes, suck it with her hands. Mm. Oh, it's a pretty universal, um, hey, uh, don't like you type of gesture, I suppose. Yeah. It's, um, well, there we go. So anyway, he destroys Veer. Shanky then grabs him during the countdown and Jinder Mahal attacks him with a chair disqualification in three minutes and 14 seconds. The three heels grab chairs. Drew is outnumbered. So he grabs his sword and dude, he knocks the sword. He knocks the chair out of Mahal's hands with the sword, knocks down Veer. And then Shanky just puts the chair down and he retreats as Jimmy gives the sage advice when your partner is a sword, you win every time. Um, I hope we're getting a duel at SummerSlam. Because I would much rather that between Jinder and Drew than a match. That would be interesting. Yeah. A drool. I've never had that. A drool. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, this was like a big, interesting, uh, you know, getaway here by by the villains. Um well, I mean, it's a big sword. Who wouldn't run away from a big sword? I the mean, there sword. were three of them with weapons. Yeah, but the sword... You can only on. stab one of them at a time. So, you know, you sacrifice one. They yeah. clearly saw Shanky as, you know, this guy has already been beaten to hell. Mm -hmm. We've mm -hmm. got Veer. If you're Jinder, you know... It's got to end... taking out... It's got to end with a stabbing, this feud, don't you think? Somebody has yeah. to get stabbed. Definitely. Probably Veer... Or probably Shanky. Poor Shanky. He could take it like medieval time style. Stephanie's like talked it. about the augmented reality. Maybe this is where we really explore. And you mm. have a hologram of Shanky that goes <laughs> into a million pieces. He gets shanked at SummerSlam. Oh my god, Shanky. <laughs> That's why they call him Shanky. He's going to get shanked by Drew's sword. Yes. Wow. Everyone that laments these creative woes at this time, and there's so much at their disposal that they're just not exploring. Yeah, no, it all makes sense. It's long-term booking. All three are fleeing in the back, and Jinder says that Drew threatened their lives. Karma is coming for him. Karma. So, okay, he's gonna... What? What does that mean? Awesome Kong? Does it mean, um... What does he actually mean? He's going to try to kill Drew now? Probably. I, I took this as threats on life. All right. Well, he's got a, plenty of repl replica swords uh, he could use. Nia Jax and Shane are in the back. Nia warns us what she's about to do. Kevin Patrick, I think, was in 100 segments tonight. He was with Drew, and 
Drew said that Chicago wanted him to finish the job tonight. They wanted me to murder them. And he says you have three options. And he looks at his fist. He does the Mirko Crow Cop. Hospital, graveyard, or Angela? Hmm. Hospital, graveyard, or Angela, yeah. I mean, if you're going to the graveyard, like, what's worse than that? Uh, I think a hospital's worse. Yeah? You feel it. You're conscious. If you're in the graveyard, you don't feel a thing. You're not, you're not conscious. Then we had this singles match. Non-title. Rhea Ripley versus Nia Jax. I don't know if it was just... Uh, so Nia Jax suffered this cut midway through, and... My God, the side of her head was just covered with blood. And I don't know what it was, but I think you it was had... an elbow. I think it was an elbow from Rio while she was up in the uh, Samoan drop. That would that would make sense. I didn't rewind to see the exact spot, but that would sound right. Um, you know, you had Rhea Ripley in a rare match where she is the the smaller one and got mm-hmm. to wrestle as like the underdog babyface. I thought the blood added to it, but even mm-hmm. that aside. I thought these two worked together pretty well. And when this ended, it, it was just like Naya missed, bounced off the ropes and got schoolboyed. This crowd popped big for this finish. I thought like this match was like surprisingly good. Uh, I can't comment on these crowd reactions anymore because I, I don't really <laughs> trust my own. I have to give some benefit of the doubt. OK, I don't I don't think they're manipulating to such a degree that we have to question every pop like this right. was. You know, this felt pretty natural. Well, I absolutely agree with you. I thought this was one of the better Nia matches that I've seen uh, in recent memory, recent history, even. Showcased uh, Rhea's aggression. Um, she felt yeah. like a baby face. Mm-hmm. Like Nia looked pretty on point, I have to say. I like the perm, first of all. I think it's a great um, crowd change. bought into the leg drop as a potential finish. Like it and, just. And yeah, her offense I thought was used really well and, and timed really well. Um, Rhea playing the underdog I thought was really effective against her. These two have good chemistry. And the. The blood was like, it was a cool visual. Like, and afterwards, Jax and Baszler are arguing. And my God, Jax is just like, she looks like Two-Face here with the the blood coming down. Baszler just leaves frustrated. Um, So the odd couple that then got on the same page, they're back to not liking one another. Every time they tease one of these, I hope this is it. But I mean, who knows? You know, maybe... God, I don't know. Reggie's already out. Like, what What more do Nia and Shayna really have to accomplish? These are tag titles that, like, them winning the titles again, I don't think will be beneficial to anybody, uh, you know, especially the two of them. I mean, what are we doing now? A feud between the two? And who's who's going to be the baby face, you think? It's, it's a real interesting question because it's, you're almost at the point now where, like, these, what are the future of these tag titles? Like, WWE is not often, like, get rid of titles. They're just more likely to just put together more random teams together, but... They never the use bi- them. The titles could be great, but they're just never never used. The, they don't give it enough attention to tag teams. So, like, Shotzi and uh, poor Shotzi and Knox are still owed a... Oh, the tag team title match, aren't they? They beat. Them well, twice. you have this unfortunate injury to Natalia that's probably just stalled anything you can do, and it looks like they are just going to wait out until Natalia is ready to come back. They're not, and they're just like, oh, oh, that's that should be a positive sign that Natalia shouldn't be gone too long. So that's mm-hmm. a good thing. Uh, and then Ripley just returned head kick and Riptide to Nia Jax. Yeah, big impressive Riptide. You know, sort of like the Hogan Andre spot for Rhea. It was a great. You know, kind of baby face win for Rhea Ripley, and I'm, I say she baby face something like this, yes. And, and I say baby face now with complete confidence because she's not cheating to win. She's not intentionally getting herself DQ'd to win. Like, what the fuck was that entire month and a half of like that entire title run was so weird. This was great. She's a she's a great baby face. <sighs> T Bar and Mace against Monsoor. And the most popular man in this building, Mustafa Ali. Ali came out. This crowd is giving him a huge reaction. I promise you this was real because they were not going to this effort for Mustafa Ali. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Especially given the way this match was laid out. So, dude, he is getting all these cheers. And he's got to play like the annoyed tag partner as Mansoor hugs him. And the crowd just, they just want to love this team. 
Mace knocks Ali off the apron, and then Ali gets this great hot tag. They hit stereo dives on opposite ends. There's a tornado DDT through the ropes by Ali to T-Bar. And then T-Bar kicks Mansoor into the ropes, crotching Ali, who lands on the floor. Mansoor is yanked down, disc is boot, and T-Bar pins Mansoor. Two minutes and 42 seconds. And, hey, Chicago, we didn't forget about this guy. They give Ali the high justice and leave him dead in the ring. Yeah. Awesome babyface making moment here. Oh, this is uh, how you make stars, you know? This is great heat. So the next time they come to Chicago, I mean, you know. Oh, man, to... that last time when T-Bar and Mace laid out <laughs> Ali after pitting Mansoor. We've waited, and now the revenge is going to occur. Yeah. I, I don't think there was any ever any merit to that sort of argument for that type of booking, man. But now you see, like, what other companies do with guys in their hometown when let's, the crowds are actually beat for punk them. his first night. At the United yes. Center, think of the heat. Think of the heat. They all bought tickets to Two see minutes. succeed, and we'll take it away from them. And then they'll pay more to come back. Think yeah, of the heat. Yeah, That'd be well, awesome. Hardy family office, I think, should should definitely just destroy oh. Punk and Danielson on their first night. But you know, you see what other companies are able to do with the momentum that the crowd gifts them. This is like a gift, okay? Like for for this team that they're trying to get off the ground. Last week, they actually had them win. They had to beat this exact team, so you couldn't have delayed the whole thing to this week just for this <laughs> they moment. They're going to beat them the, f- the first week, so second week when they go to Chicago, that's that's when we'll beat them. I don't fucking T-Bar get it, and man. Mace, they're untouchable. We can't we can't beat them this you, week. You though. already beat them once. You can't have a beat them twice, and then th- th- these are serious characters. Okay, these Ugh. are men of the jungle. Okay, they they eat these so, people. So it's like it's just more 50-50. In the end, everybody gets dragged back down into mid-card obscurity, okay? Next time you come to Chicago, like, these people are still going to cheer for this guy, Ali, okay? Because, like, he has earned that trust locally with that audience through years and years and years of hard work. So I feel like he'll still... All these guys now, their biggest hope, if you're under, like, I don't know, 220 pounds, your biggest hope is that the audience cheers you enough that they'll eventually pay attention but man it's they, they why love work against because audience. not only is he the hometown guy but it's like <laughs> this is a this is a remarkable individual if you follow him oh my god cast yeah. in this role where we're supposed to hate this man yeah no sorry it's it's, it's never mind let's just let's move on i'm getting sad charlotte flair comes out if if we get uh MJF and uh, Ric Flair going back and forth. Do you believe that within the next two months, if that, uh, I'll, I'll give it six months, okay? That we could, uh, Charlotte could be going through the uh, the loss of a surname transition. Very interesting. Okay, just back to Charlotte? Yes. Um, I can't imagine they're that petty. Come on, at this point. She was Charlotte for a long time. But that was not because of ill will towards Rick. You know? Um... I, I, it's possible, but I mean, I feel like she would have something to say about that at this point. She brings up Simone Biles withdrawing at the Olympics and found out it was due to mental health issues and found that relatable to herself and her own nervous breakdown after Nikki Ash cashed in the money in the bank briefcase, taking her title. Yeah, I didn't know about that. You know, I, I, I really, first of all, I don't think the analogy was like done very well. I, I And it just really felt like a way of bringing up, you know, like a real kind of, I guess, uh, relevant story right now and a real relevant mental health, I guess, uh, case right now in, in, in sports and trying to use it for this promo. I don't think it was done all that well. And it just kind of left you with a bit of a bad taste by the end. Yeah, I... I... I did not like this comparison uh, for anyone that knows the Simone Biles story. I just, I, I didn't feel it was, um, you know, material that should be just used here for a cheap heel line. I don't even think it was a- effective in like actually getting heat. It was just kind of brought up and then used for this reason, but I didn't think it was all that effective. The crowd chanted for Becky Lynch and she said, she's not here. I sold out the Allstate Arena. And she notes she's been cashed in on three times. That's the only way you can make a name for yourself against me. She's pulling out the weapons and that 
She is going to beat Nikki Ash tonight. There's no hiding. And with that, Ash, who had been hiding, hit her from behind with a chair shot. And that would be our main event tonight, a no-holds-barred non-title match between Nikki Ash and Charlotte Flair. I really like Charlotte's, like, delivery. I like her confidence. But, like, you know, these these segments aren't really always hits. Um, whether it be through the material or maybe some of the awkwardness of... Uh, the segments themselves, like, I didn't really understand why she was bringing weapons out to illustrate her point, you know? She was like, I was cast in on not once, not twice, but three times, and each time she brought out a weapon. What was the point of that? I understand what the point was. It was for Nikki Ash to come in and hit her with a weapon, but in, in by by the character's logic, why? Why why did she do that? Did you note where she, uh, she like everybody, or don't know what to call her opponent, she referred to her as Nikki Ash Cross. Nikki Ash Cross. All right. Kevin Patrick is back. Man's got 10 million things to do on this show. He's with Eva Marie and Dewdrop. Ugh, Eva doesn't care about Natalia's injury. She saved Dewdrop from the farm. Doesn't even know where she's from. When she goes to say Scotland, Eva cuts her off. She's awful. Dewdrop is imprisoned. Yeah. Yep. It's a story. Tamina versus Dewdrop. Tamina came out with both both belts. They gave an update on Natalia, noting she has torn ligaments, had surgery in Birmingham, Alabama last week, and hopes to be back soon. The CM Punk chance picked up in this match. Uh, there was an elbow and sent on to the ribs of Tamina. And then towards the end, there's a super kick that gets blocked, and Dewdrop hits like the lightest leg kick, and Tamina sells this like she was um Nancy Kerrigan getting hit with a pipe here. She just collapsed to the floor. Eva is yelling instructions and therefore Dewdrop uh, stops in her tracks. And then she goes for this running cross body that appeared to semi hit Tamina and semi not hit her, but was not supposed to hit her. So Tamina got up and hit the Samoan drop and won in 350. And Eva is frustrated with her partner Dewdrop and they argued Mm-hmm. Yeah, because she, well, she cost her the match, but she acts like she wasn't paying attention or at least um, didn't follow instruction. So uh, this story continues. And Alexa Bliss appeared on the screen announcing the loser of the match, Eva Marie. And she just laughed hysterically. Riddle met with his pal, Damien Priest, and told him a story about his fish, Swim Shady. And that he will be fine out there with Omos because he has Randy Orton coursing through his veins tonight and asks Damien why he's not out celebrating his non-title win from last week over Sheamus. Priest says, oh, I was celebrating at Lollapalooza all week. Oh, you're cool, man. Awesome. Then these two did like the <laughs> lamest like hand gesture you have ever seen. No, man, it was cool. They were like, it was rad. Yeah, it was rad. Miz TV, the Miz says he is inviting Damien Priest out because he is going to let, quote, bygones be by bonds. <laughs> he's going to go to the bank to take these bygones and he's going to invest in uh, li- limited risk bonds. Yes. Priest comes out. Dude, I don't know what these three were talking about. It was awful dialogue. The crowd chanted for Punk. (laughs) Priest then defends the actions that he did to Sheamus because he was cleared. But Sheamus is a badass, unlike you guys, and questions if Miz is really hurt and says, is the injury to your knee or is the injury or is it a problem between your legs? You know, Hmm. your dick. (laughs) Priest calls or, Miz, or, 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 or I mean, or the balls. Like, I, I guess there's um, d- depending on where you think he was taking aim at. Miz was offended by this. Um, Miz brought up, he's like, "Listen, I haven't been injured in 16 years until I had to wrestle with you with a bunch of fucking zombies." Okay. I hate. <laughs> so what this is that shit. supposed to mean in storyline? Like, I mean, isn't the goal of a match to injure your opponent? Um, you can take it that way. Yes. 
So this is uh, Damien Priest is another. Isn't he level. saying Damien Priest is actually very the most talented. dangerous man of the past sixteen years? Is Damien Priest? Yeah, isn't that a good thing? Yeah, you can take it as that. Okay. He did not get squirted because he blocked the drip stick, and then ended up squirting the Miz with the drip stick. Yeah, he's got a very effective counter to the drip stick. He just sticks his hand out. Damien Priest and John Morrison. It went four minutes. The Starship pain was stopped. He uh, Morrison hit a standing shooting star and then caught Morrison, Dominator, big Uranagi, pins him. Seamus jumps Priest while wearing the U.S. title. Very Tim Sylvia of him. Ricochet, at least I believe that's who this individual was. I didn't quite recognize him. Ran down, springboard drop kick to Seamus. He helps out Damien Priest. We've got a tag match. So we got four more minutes of wrestling. Uh, Ricochet looked very good here. They set up a spot where Miz soaked the mat and then Morrison sent Ricochet sliding like that old, uh, what was it called? Mile. Crocodile Mile. And slid right into the steps, which was not the kid-friendly version of Crocodile Mile. Priest gets the tag. The Moonlight Drive is stopped. He hits this chokeslam that is called the South of Heaven Chokeslam. Seamus saves. Ricochet does a moonsault to the floor. And Priest pins Morrison with the Reckoning in 353. Man, poor John Morrison got pinned twice. In these That's fine. Matches, you know what? Man. We need baby faces. And they, they put Damian Priest over twice here. I was fine with this. Yeah. We need sure. some baby faces. Yeah. Uh we do. I, I guess um I feel like the audience likes Priest. Again, it's hard to tell anymore, but I feel like they like Priest, but I don't know if they love Priest. It it just comes across to me like it's a very manufactured push right now and yeah manufactured is better than no push at all but it does not necessarily feel like he is connecting with the audience yeah i mean he had that big gap and i don't think you were able to really build off of like they did the month program after bad bunny with the whole zombie stuff uh, and then he was gone for a bit of time uh and since coming back like it feels like he's in a, a fine position i think him and sheamus obviously they're building to a title match They've I mean, had good I, chemistry together? Cer- certainly. I really feel like it's Morrison and The Miz who are the ones that are connecting with the audience. They're the ones that are entertaining. They're the ones that are coming up with these creative spots. Damien Priest is out here to play a role. And he's out here to, like, you know, essentially, like, bully people that I actually think the audience likes. So, again, it's re- they can really kind of, like, kill these, you know, negative crowd chants if they want to these days. But I, I just don't necessarily sense... Mm, I don't know that much favor for for Damian Priest. Lashley accepted the match with Goldberg. Hopes he brings Gage to SummerSlam. Patrick is with Omos. We saw you demolish Riddle's scooter last week. What can we expect in the ring? And he compared what he did to the scooter to what he will do to Riddle's spine tonight. So we have mm. got the threat of murder, paralysis. Yeah, all, all a lot of anger you- issues on this show. All things you expect on a wrestling program. Yeah. Omos and Riddle. So Riddle jumps on his back at the beginning and he tries to attack Omos with forearms and Omos launches this dude into the timekeepers area. He battles back, beating the count. Then he gets sent back down to the floor. He beats the count again. He fires up with some flying knees before Omos destroys him with a lariat. Tree slam. He pins Riddle in two minutes and 35 seconds. And despite being advertised on both the Allstate Arena site and the WWE site, there was no Randy Orton insight on this show. And this just kind of felt like a very flat loss for Riddle to take. And it wasn't even by any nefarious means. He was beaten by the more powerful individual. It was a little surprising to see Riddle in a role like this, because I feel like he's a pretty well-protected guy on this roster. And I feel like a win like this from almost should have felt bigger than perhaps it was just as a two minute match on raw. Um, and maybe better yet, maybe it shouldn't necessarily, it shouldn't have happened at all perhaps. Cause I do feel like riddle is one of your rare guys that, you know, like still has like built up some protected cachet here, but you know, uh, if you're talking about building baby faces, I think they're making the most of Omos's abilities he, he, using some pretty like base level offense. But I think he's getting better at like grunting and doing all the giant stuff that like WWE likes to have their giants do. And overall, it was effective for the aim that they set out for. 
Grunting is usually that last step that you need to take. Yeah, the monster school. Yeah. Uh, after Alexa Bliss is with Lily, who she notes is an influencer. She has influenced Jack the Ripper, the Zodiac, Ed Leslie. And before she can continue, she is attacked by Dewdrop from behind. Eva then takes Lily, who is left on the playground, calling her yucky and gross. This is evolution. They walk off. Alexa is dead. And Lily rises up on the grass as this silly music plays. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... Man, this was so shitty. It was really bad. Um, But, you know, like... I guess it has its fans. Again, it's like... It's hard for me Ooh, to say. Who are these fans? I There, there are Alexa like loyalists who love this stuff i guess well i i don't know if they're looking with a with a balanced viewpoint then you know it's like it's it it's kind of shitty because we have here like a spinoff of the bray wyatt fiend character and we don't have the original so it just feels like we are stuck with kind of like a cheap knockoff um that again some people like but i just I, I just think it's a t- oh, it's not so much for me. Um, as much as I can laugh at it, it's awful. Karen crosses out. He does an hourglass promo. All our days are numbered, and Lee's time is up because it's time for a rematch with Keith Lee. And they brought us back to last August, reminding us that Keith Lee once beat Randy Orton on a pay per view at Payback. Well, tonight was Keith Lee's payback, folks, in the same arena where he appeared in the crowd at NXT TakeOver. Here he was back. And the story of this was not Karrion Cross. The story was Keith Lee cannot lose a third match in a row. There was an ever so light NXT chant, and Lee slingshots himself into Cross. Graves complains, saying he does these great moves, but then he basks in the glory too long. There's a Doomsday Saido sending Keith Lee into the steps on the floor. The steps got a lot of usage on the show. Afterwards, Lee comes back with a big sequence of strikes. And then, (laughs) I mean, there's the term hulking up. This man has been told, you are literally the Incredible Hulk, okay? That is what you are to uh, replicate. So he turns green, hits a shoulder tackle, and the Saido gets blocked There's a strike to the back of the head. Cross applies the cross jacket. Going on to take over. Strong win for Karrion Cross. Bit of that momentum is realized. They're they're different people, John. Like it's They are. Why don't they just call why can't this guy just be like Kevin Cross? Kevin Cross. No NXT title. Cross in Cross. He's in a mask. Lucha Lucha Cross. Lucha Cross? Yeah, I don't know, man. Uh, It's he breaks out know. of the cross jacket and spirit bombs Carrion, and Keith Lee is your winner in 926. The story is not that Carrion Cross is even on a losing streak. The story is Keith Lee is back on the winning track, and that's who you should be focused on. Yes, so uh, he's not a complete loser. This is the. Uh, he's one and two. <laughs> he's one and two. As is Carrion Cross. On- Carrion Cross is one and two. So congratulations, 50 <laughs> 50. Everyone's the same. 50 50 yeah um you know in the end i mean the rumor is that they originally wanted to have cross go on this losing streak to set up a scarlet return perhaps they'll still do the same with this uh, but i mean in the end it's a terrible idea either way because you're you're just ending up with everybody being seen as average competitors and it just sucks especially because this man happens to carry the most coveted prize on your other show. So at this point, I really just like w- hope that they just take that belt off of him as soon as they can. You know, that takeover can't come soon enough. Patrick is with Ripley called her match with Nia brutal, but not as brutal as no holds barred will be tonight. She'll be watching. We are once again, reintroduced to Reggie who gives us some explanation and context. I used Reginald to get my foot in the door. Now I can be my true self, not just a sommelier. And he has defied the odds his whole life. 
He did not explain how he defied or what odds were placed against him. He just defied them, and he is here. Yeah, this is sort of um, the the true reveal of Reggie, and I believe he's a baby. He is a baby face. Oh, now. he's definitely a baby face. Now. This was supposed, supposed to be, to be an baby- inspiring baby face. This was his baby face promo. You know, he was not Carmella's sommelier. That was just a means to an end to get his foot through the door in the WWE. Now he can truly be himself. So yay. Sommelier. So he takes on Akira Tozawa. There was this one moment where Reggie went for this right punch that did not appear to connect, but Tozawa just sold it anyway. It was very odd. And then the story was just Reggie just flipping his way so Tozawa could not catch him that Jimmy Smith compared to he <laughs> Reggie makes everyone the Keystone cops. Uh, and then Graves said, what a dated reference. And Jimmy Smith said, you understood what I was talking about, though. So shut That's up. Good. That's a good comeback. Absolutely. It was pretty good. Tozawa runs, misses him, hits his face on the rope. And then Tozawa yells at Reggie to stop and yells, ninja power. Mm-hmm. And then does a rotation and Reggie hits an elbow in mid-rotation running cannonball, and he pins Tozawa in 207. I actually, I think these, uh, <laughs> I think this Reggie dude is fun to watch. I like seeing the agility. I like seeing some of the creativity and some of the spots they, they, uh, do with, with that agility. Um, this was totally fine. It just, man, it's just sad because I, I feel like there's so much being wasted with Akira Tozawa. And I understand the guy is like not somebody to, to that they, that Vince personally probably ever chose. Um, it's just, it's sad he's just pl- here playing this like really awful stereotypical ninja gimmick this entire time. But I'm happy. If he, if he had showed up at the Globe Theater on Sunday and wrestled under a mask. Uh-huh. I wonder if no one would have even known. Like, would that have even noticed? Like, who is this mysterious, the masked ninja? Nobody would have noticed. No. And at this point, even if he took the mask off, I mean, the man has kind of devalued his name so much by being a part of this. I just don't know how how much people would care. But uh, uh, he's an insanely talented wrestler, just, you know, on the wrong show for his to appreciate it. Patrick interviewed Nikki Ash. She doesn't know what to expect from Charlotte Flair. But Charlotte did not expect her earlier tonight, and that's part of being almost a superhero. You don't know what to expect, but you have to give your best. I don't know which plot point that is from in a Marvel film. You don't know what to expect, but you have to give your best. None of them, dude. What characteristic is that from? Kevin Feige would have thrown this script in the trash. Are you kidding me? This is some of the worst, like... Oh, these inspirational speeches from Nikki Cross are just fucking terrible. I like to me, like I didn't need to hear Michael Cole in some of this like re- crowd reaction to know that this shit is bullshit. OK, because I can't imagine anybody in that audience, no matter what age you are, buying into these awful speeches. They're so like, seriously, John, come on. Like they're hitting the inspirational story so hard. No, it's it, it, it's really falling. Like they are going too hard with this character in my mind, and it's um, there's certainly going to be, I, I think, um, a resistance to to this character in, in this style. Yeah. So maybe she she'll know- be she'll be Nikki ASV, almost a super villain. Oh, okay. She knows she has the confidence to beat Flair, and if you believe in yourself, you can almost be a superhero. But I guess you come up short then, right? From the intended purpose? I guess. How do you become an actual superhero? Is that not the most obvious question you would have for this character? Why do you almost want to be a superhero? Don't you want to go yeah, the like, full... full doesn't, don't don't you want to be a superhero? Well, you would think that winning the championship is your ultimate destination, and therefore you become a superhero by the time you win the title. But I think it, maybe it, maybe she means when you... When you defend it like 16 times. Okay. No holds barred match. Grave said he wants a pet grizzly bear, but that's not realistic. And Jimmy Smith called that the Khabib special. Flair clears the desk. She pretty much wrestled this match like she was just furious. 
She, the crowd, all they wanted were table spots in this match. And when Flair brought this table out, they went nuts. Ripley is watching in the back. This is where Flair yells, suck it at a fan. She spears Nikki through the barricade for the commercial. And Flair is dominating the match. There's some punk chants. Flair power bombs Nikki through the announcer's desk. That got a big reaction. She stands on Nikki in the ring. Nikki kicks out, staggers up to her feet. And Flair goes for a spear, missing Nikki and going through the table in the corner and appeared to cut herself. The crowd got into this. Uh, there's a spinning neck breaker off the middle rope, and Nikki pins Charlotte in 14 minutes and 36 seconds and just holds up the belt. And they state that no one will ever count Nikki out again. So she's she's a superhero now. Or almost one. Yeah. Almost. All right. Okay. Well, you know what? I, I like the match. I thought it put Nikki over very strong. Um, Again, I don't know how good it's working, but you know, it's all the good underdog. The, the weapons story. worked for this crowd. I mean, that yep. seemed like the crowd sounded very lively for this last match. Sure, yeah. She was beaten half to death. She managed to come back, slay the dragon. But man, it's just like the character's so corny. I I just I think it's you know, you see the crowd reaction around her, like they seem to be cheering visually. But um it's weird to judge these shows, so I'm sorry. I don't if I'm not if I'm rambling and not making much sense. Well, I mean, after tonight, we've uh, we've still got what two matches on the Raw side. They haven't announced Drew's match yet. We've got the women's title match, and we've got Lashley and Goldberg. Am I missing anything? Um, Drew match Lashley Goldberg. Like they've teased stuff. They've teased like Sheamus and Priest. They've teased Drew in some mm-hmm. form or fashion with Jinder Mahal. Um. And, yeah, I think, and I guess the big question is, are we going to get AJ and Omos against Riddle and Randy Orton? That would be the other hmm. thing they're teasing. It seems like it's a pretty big card. And granted, it's SummerSlam, so it'll probably go four hours. I don't even know if it's... I mean, when Five? you include the kickoff, yes. They're starting at 8, and they're going to be done by 11. So it depends on how long the kickoff is. But, I mean, we've just been getting these one-hour kickoffs. So it looks like four, which is usually like one match on the kickoff. So it's not... the. It's not the longest card. It's not like uh, 2016 when SummerSlam was a four-hour main show, for instance. Hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um. You know, they, they could fill it out if they wanted to. That they could. Let's go to feedback. Tonight, the show gets a 3.67 from the readers at forum.postwrestling.com. Why don't you start things off? All right, we got a Brian from New Jersey who says, like most weeks, Raw felt really long, even with that packed Chicago crowd. Parody we failed to know. They, they were sold out tonight. They were completely sold out at the Allstate Arena. So that, that's worth noting. Um, the amount of demand in the Chicago market, both you know WWE included. Parody booking hit the mat. Hit the hat trick as Mason T-Bar beat Ali and Mansoor. Lee beat Cross and Nikki beat Charlotte. Cross can't lose the NXT title soon enough as he and Lee are both 1-2 and two these past three weeks. My high points were the main event. John Morrison, Miz, and Damian Priest in general. Ricochet resurfacing and the brief instances of the crowd chanting for Wyatt. Also, WWE showing that if Dynamite can have a gauge, so can Raw. That kid grew up. <laughs> I didn't even pair those two together. That's a very good point from Brian. We got... Uh... Yeah, the the other gauge. <laughs> well, he says, speaking of Nick Gage, will we see any viewers or sponsors raise eyebrows at eyebrows at Nia Drax's bloody face like they did at the Gage match? Mm, I don't. Uh, no, I don't even think that's going to see anything. Not fair, the... It's not a fair comparison. I mean, blood is not the issue. I don't think. Yeah, uh, Andrew from Cape Breton. This is my first time watching Raw in a while, and with fans, it does seem like the crowd sweetening is pretty obvious. While the odd punk and We Want Wyatt chant got through, they definitely tried to cover up some dead spots with other things. The clip of Drew is going around, but it did seem the crowd did get into him attempting to kill people with a sword. And I want to see Drew cut a pizza and that sword for some reason. One compare and contrast I want to make is to AEW and Hometown Stars. It seems that with Lance Archer, Ricky Starks, and now Punk and Britt Baker being pushed as Hometown Stars, AEW looks like it's trying to build up hometowns to try and do repeat business in these markets. It reminds me of the days where PCO and the Quebecois wrestlers didn't want to lose in Montreal. It seems silly, but they had real drawing power, and a guy like Mustafa Ali is just another guy, even with a big reaction in his hometown. Decent show, 5 out of 10. 
We got a Kate from Montreal who says, I was really hoping that we'd get a longer run before the first apathetic crowd at a wrestling show. That's not to say there weren't moments where the crowd got excited, particularly towards the end of the main event, but a lot of the time the faces in the audience just looked disinterested, and I can't really blame them. The thing that struck stuck me struck me was that much of the actual wrestling was below par. Normally, the in-ring is good to great on Raw, but a lot of people seemed off their game tonight. Everything about the show seemed sloppy and clunky. All in all, I think Chicago showed a lot of restraint. Yes, there were some Punk and Wyatt chants, but I think it could have been a whole lot worse. I would say if you were just watching uh, clean, that it, it, it was not a crowd where it was... Uh dominating uh the chance i think you know they were noticeable i think you would have heard them but they were hardly like the story of the show that maybe some thought um they would be on this show but i would say also uh, they, wwe is probably pretty ready save for that clip they, you know if that clip going around is going to amplify that discussion but i think also they went into this show perfectly aware of what the potential was yeah it otherwise sounded like a pretty standard show um it will be interesting to see like just a clip like that circulating. Um, is that going to encourage fans to continue with these chants? Well, to what effect? Um, I think just, just making it more, more difficult. I mean, if you, if you get prolonged chance, uh, it's hard to say not being in the building, like were they really yeah. subdued? I'm definitely curious to see more, um, perhaps evidence to, see if this is truly the case of like maybe audience reactions being caught on cell phone footage compared side by side with what we see on tv right uh, like really try to like now that now that i would say most people are, are aware that they're piping in audio just to kind of really like dive a bit deeper into this investigation you know so since this is the first tv since since like the promo last week and everyone's had a week to really see the effects of this uh, are we going to start hearing the punk chants on Dynamite? Yeah, I think so. Why not? Like, I, I think they're going to start as revolting chants or as not revolting. It's chance. just like they know what's coming. And if you have oh, Darby yeah. come out there and cut a promo, like I think they might want to encourage these chants. And they were, they were encouraging it. Like you're going to have like almost the opposite effect of what fans have been trained to. Like these chants have been synonymous with we don't like what's happening. It's almost mm-hmm. this. Um, protest chant and instead AEW is going to use it now as a promotion for the next couple of weeks and I see the crowds really getting into it and these chants are going to be you know building to this big reveal on August 20th it's funny how let a name being chanted by one crowd can have a totally different meaning than a name being chanted by another crowd but you know at this point CM Punk I mean you know since his exit it has been a representative of the outsider you know a representative of the away team when you're the wwe and the away team for all intents and purposes is aew so it's aew you know like those fans are chanting for somebody that they know is coming in all right well we are going to be discussing all of it on wednesday night uh once again on tuesday we've got the ask away mailbag show that's available for all members of the post wrestling cafe uh it should be a pretty lengthy show we have quite a lot of questions to get to plus andrew thompson interviewing chris hero and up next and we'll be back live wednesday night 10 15 eastern for double double ice cap and espresso patrons right after dynamite homecoming they are back at daly's place coming home they're coming home Mm -hmm. Tell the world. Tell the world. Okay, that is it. Goodbye. Thank you.